Okay. And so, if two E's or an EI equals, pronounce it like A. A. So, K. What are you, queer? K. What's the difference? <laughs> or yeah? gum. Huh? Gum. What do you get to gum? Gum? Uh, yeah, that, that's all, but there are many different words to say no, oh. to, to express a negative. But this is simply a yes or no. Uh, when something is not, come go stay. Come go stay. Stop being sick. You're making yourself sick. Yeah. So that's where you do come. Go. Come go stay. S T I I I. Gum goes to E. That's one of our principles of healing. Stop being sick, you're making yourself sick. Gum goes to E. A lot of times, like this morning, I woke up feeling cranky, and I thought to myself, I don't want to feel like this. So I changed my mood just by refusing to be sick because I'm making myself sick. You can do that, and we do this when uh, somebody's badly injured. Uh, we were playing softball, and the pitcher pitched, and the batter really cracked that ball. And I was standing over by third base, and I saw the ball right, go right at his face. And the, it, when it hit, I seen the glass shatter. <coughs> And he grabbed his face and it took a moment for people to react. And they got him over the side where they called an ambulance. And I walked over and he had his face, his hand over his face, and you could see he was bleeding. And I knew he was going to go into shock. So I said to him, What the hell's the matter with you? I told you to keep your eye on the ball, but I didn't mean it literally. He got mad. I got him out of his head. He stopped thinking about the wound on his face. Come go stay. Stop being sick. You're making yourself. You can kill yourself like that. People with small wounds will kill themselves worrying about how bad it is. My father got a hook in the back of his head, a triple hook, trolling. What it was was a break on what they call a birdie, it's a little winch for you drop your cable down for trolling, you got your leaders on it. And he pulled it up, and instead of swinging that lead in, we call it a cannonball, and setting it on deck, he left it hanging out there. And he was pulling in a fish, and all of a sudden that the hook came out of the fish's mouth, and he accidentally hit the lever on that and released the brake. And that cannonball went down, and that lip whipped through his hand, and the hook hooked him back here and pulled his head down to the deck and his, and his crewman, the puller, was wondering what's wrong with him. Finally, my dad was yelling, cut me loose, cut me loose. So anyway, they went into the bay there and they were trying to get a hold of me to tell me my dad was injured. So I went to where they were anchored and I went in and dad had that hook in the back of his head and he kept trying to see it in the mirror. And I knew he was going to probably go into shock from it. So I said, um, I said, Jesus, you'll do any damn thing to go into town to get a drink. <laughs> and he looked at me and he sat down. My cousin, Raleigh, yanked me out on deck and just slammed me against the wheelhouse. He said, why did you say that to your dad? I said, you watch him. He was going to go into shock. Now he would sit right there and wait for the airplane to come and get him. And that's what he did. He waited for the airplane to come and get him. But he was so focused on that. It wasn't really that bad. It, but it, you know, it, the barb was in there. He could just pull it out and go and get a doctor and take it out. 
It's a pretty different take on medicine in the Western, like comfort and, you know, uh -huh. sure to prevent shock and out of blanket kind of thing. Yeah, it's a different way of looking at it. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a little different little care and technique too. Uh, um, when you're out, you know, on, on the war field there, you got a lot of injured soldiers. There's a hard way to go into shock, but if you get to them before that, you can tell them, stop, look at me. Everything's going to be just fine. If you listen to me, you do what I say, you'll be just fine. And they get out of it. As soon as you snap them out of it, yeah. um, it's a, you know, you know, those are other words you can use because they work. Yeah, it's a lot of it is your perspective. Like, for example, I told my wife, I said, I just found my first gray hair. You can't hardly really see it, it's hidden in with the white ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> fortunate that she's a woman of great calm and presence. <laughs> but anyway, so you have many ways of saying no. Getting uh, up. So this, this can be just simply responding negatively, but here's another one. somebody a question about something and they're very emphatic. No! Ka'anu! Get. There's no Ka'anu. Then it's very emphatic. So there's different ways of doing that. Um, are you stupid or are you practicing? <laughs> <laughs> so you got to have some fun. Okay. So if you can practice this, oh, let's see. Some of the questions don't, are, don't really work out well halfway out in the yes or no answer. Like, is your brother uglier than you? Um, if you say yes, you're admitting you're ugly. If you say no, you're admitting you're ugly. You <laughs> but if you say my brother is ugly, then you're saying I'm not ugly either. <laughs> So English, you can play with words like that, but it's the same way here. Uh, but it's in the vocal inflection of how you say it. Um, for example, when I was about 12, maybe yeah, 12 years old, I would take the uh, my grandmother and the other ladies berry picking had to go out to an island. And I liked going with them because I liked their lunch. And I'd go around, I'd take berries out of your baskets or containers. And one day I went up, and one of the grandmothers was bawling out her granddaughter. You stay away from those boys. They just want one thing from you. Now go on over there and take it. And this other lady, she kind of chuckled. And the way she said it was, uh, sometimes you're good for that one thing. <laughs> you have to run out of beats, you know, to laugh. But just how they phrase things is, if you just say it straight, it doesn't mean much. But when you can put some emphasis on it, so our languages are very expressive. And even your dancing. Like, for example, you know, you see the women dancing with their hands here, but it can be very expressive, too, in how you move. The one time it's the song we're going to use is that Women that walk in the ranks of chiefs didn't dance this way, they danced this way. So it was different. Uh, but even just, just how you can move your body can be very expressive. And in the men, See, on our side of the line, we didn't, uh, we weren't really exposed so much to 
we'll say like the prairies where they jump around and we didn't have much of that. And in the old days when uh, our canoes were traveling someplace, they would have planks across and a person was to dance on that plank while the canoes are moving. So you couldn't jump. And inside the house, you've got a limited amount of space. So instead of jumping, the men would run on their, would just raise up on the ball of their feet and keep, because it said that a man, a man the head of a family, a big family, is like a man standing on a windy point. The wind and the waves are coming. And he's got to protect everybody behind him. So he anchors himself. It's sort of like martial arts. When that big wave comes, he can push it aside, but he checks to make sure everybody's still there. If the wave is too big, he lets it roll over him. And so those were the basic movements. And a part of the dance comes from when the men were first, males were coaxed to come out of that clam shell. As they came out, the light was very bright and Raven was watching. And as their lungs filled with air and their bodies began to express feelings of their muscles, all they could see was a shadow of Raven moving. So they start moving with, with Raven. So that's when they started dancing was by watching Raven was walking. So when, when we see our dances and we hear our songs, <clears throat> It's not simply uh, expressing your own yourself uh, to the music, because it's a very, very uh, intense form of communications, and it has a story in it. Uh, they talked about one guy's poem was real lazy, and everybody was dancing except him. <laughs> He was just standing there, playing like that. And I said, what are you doing? Why aren't you dancing? He said, I'm doing cockle dance. You know, the foot inside of a cockle. <laughs> <laughs> he was just lazy. <laughs> so you hear things like that. One man, he was ashamed of his uncle because his uncle was so stingy. When he'd go visit his uncle, they never gave him something to eat. So what he'd do is he'd pick up a stone from by the fire and he'd put it in his mouth. So when he went out of the house, it looked like he was chewing on food because he had that rock in there. <laughs> because there, there were certain <clears throat> etiquettes, I guess you'd say, in ways that you did things. Uh, beginning probably October, when the, um, when the skook became chaga, when they turned real black, that's when the feasting would begin. Uh, we could come here and maybe on Haida Gwaii too, it begin when the frogs would freeze. And then that was the, some of them called the, the ceremony time and it goes till about March when the frogs thawed out. And so the frog represented reincarnation because if the tree sold it, then when it thawed, it would go back to life. These little bullets, oh, they do that too. You freeze them in ice, you take them out of the ice, put them in the water, pretty soon they swim away. So that, that's what that, uh, uh, it's a scan called scan. The scan, uh, is a bush. A stone is a dungeness crab. So a frog is actually a bush crab because the way it walks. And the um, giant green sea turtle is called Kanaka, so Kanaka stone, Hawaiian crab, because of the way it's, its flippers move too in the water. So you'll find things that have the same name that don't seem to be have any relationship to each other. But how they came up with those classifications, I don't know. Pete is tree. Pete, sea lion. But I asked about it. 
And so my uncle said, well, when you're in the ocean, you see a whole bunch of sea lions. When they're laying there in the water, their their flippers are going like this. And that's the way a tree moves when the wind blows. <laughs> and then I don't, I tried to find it, uh, the term for octopus tentacle. It's also the term for washing windows. Because when the octopus is tentacle moves, it, it makes that motion. <laughs> if you're washing windows. And so when you look at those those words, uh, the word kelp, which translates to ice, is also the word for glass. Because you can see through it, it's transparent. Kelp. Um, so that's very characteristic in Latin language that the root of the word means what it does. Uh -huh. And I wonder if a lot of languages are like that or if it's Haida is just a coincidence too or I tried to find that out if there are certain words that have certain roots to them. And some of them do. Like for example, uh, this uh, But that's different from just down here. That's a dog. And this is the root word for your spirit. This uncle, uh, his name was Ani, uh, Delbert Nix. He asked me if I knew when the dog learned to bark. And I said, yeah, I know when the dog learned to bark. And he said, how do you know? I told him because Coco told me. But it's a story of how the dog learned to bark. Prior to the ice, which was it called? Uh, anyway, it was before the ice and the men were hunting, and they'd run down an animal, and there were some wolves that would, would follow them, and they would lay down facing where they're cutting up the meat, and the females and pups would be hidden. And when they got through cutting up the meat, they'd leave some for this wolf. And they would call to the pups and to the females, <coughs> And they would come and they would feed. And over a very long period of time, <coughs> one day it says that four of these wolves came to their Lamai. That was before we had villages. Lamai was just sort of like a large camp. Lamai. And uh, there was a place called Sagua Plan Lamai. Sagua Plan is the north end of the land camp. And that was north of Prince Wales Island. That's before we moved south, when the ice came. Anyway, one day they noticed that these four wolves had come up, four or five of them, they were laying there facing the fire. And so the people watched them. And then they stood up and as they turned to leave, they, they turned their heads and started coming. <coughs> and they left. You know, what's that all about? And not very long after, they came back and they repeated it. And after about the third, maybe fourth time, they decided, let's go find out what's going on. So they followed those wolves. And they had a big animal corner, but it was too big for them to bring down. So they brought the humans over there. So the humans brought it down and left half for them. And they say, that's when the dog learned to bark. And the dog is the only one in the canine world that barks. Your wolves don't bark, your coyotes don't bark. You know, none of them bark except the dog. <laughs> so that's what we say, that's how the dog um, learned to bark. But this one here is the root word for, for your spirit. 
Yeah. Uh, so a lot of our work became Englishized. For example, I asked my dad about this one. Oh, uh, what does that describe? And he said, this is what it describes. That means you touch my spirit. Not thank you. None of the tribal languages have words of thank you. The Nisqas say, I am bound to you. And my dad said that means you touch my spirit. So when somebody just says, hello, it's almost like an insult to me. Because this, our language expresses deep feelings. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. I was speaking before a group here at home, and I told them that I heard that the highest expression in our language kills God. And immediately all of them says, Get, how up? Not this one, not kill slide. Kill slide is a different kind of a term. This is when I've extolled someone's virtues or something's virtues. There's as high as I can say. Then the final word is kill slide. There's nothing more that can be said about this. That's as high as you can go. And so some people use that as a drinking toast. But this is actually saying that's as high as you can go in saying all that about something or somebody. So how ah, how ah, not how ah. And also, you see this word, alas. It can be half high, but when you say loss, put put down. Uh, or even a D. That's all the people, all the people. I got loss, but then also the end at the end is is is. loss is, for example, be quiet on your stand, be just on your stand. Half loss is. My brothers, my sisters, and all you good people. So Hadalas is uh, came mostly from people who didn't speak the language, but have been Englishizing, and so it becomes Hadal Hada Hadalas instead of Hadas Lasses. Hadas Lasses. So it's really important that you. Pronounce things care, uh, carefully. Uh, my my nan, she had two Haida names. One was Sly Tawai Kulas, the other one was Namkhanbandas. Namkhanbandas is a deep sea rolling wave when it reaches its peak of power. And the other one, Sly is your hands, Tawai is oil. Kriwas is something that's hanging, and so it's symbol. It's, it, it really refers to the person with precious healing hands. And when she was in her nineties, she was talking to my mother one day, and my mother asked, "Who are you talking about?" And she said, "You know that bastard that lives down close by your house." And my mother said, "What do you mean? You know, one of those guys never got married." Oh, Baxter, Baxter, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
See, they make mistakes with English the way we make it with Ida. And so you get kind of funny, funny, uh, funny words from that sometimes, and funny, funny results. Uh, so anyway, if you're answering, what I was trying to do was to, to instead of saying this is yes, we'll say that these are plus or true. Do you have on one shoe? Or? I can't hear that. Two. <laughs> you have on two shoes? Yes. Um. 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 Mm. And then sometimes that's the way people would say it say as own. And when uh, you ask them kind of a dumb question, they say, hmm. <laughs> But um, um, that's true. Or and if I ask, uh, is your hair green? Gay. Gay. It's gay. Gay. Yeah, I make it short. Gay. 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 Rather than gay. 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 So, gay. Um, gay. Um, and um, gay. Yeah. Something that. <laughs> was suggested last time was maybe we can start using some very short phrases. Um, so we'll start with Gyatla. 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 Stand up. Outla. 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 Gyatla. Outlaw. <laughs> Say it to him now. Outlaw. 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 And now. Outlaw. 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 You're going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is me. I'm backwards. That's me from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> So it's your turn now to tell her. Gyatla. No, Gyatla. 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 Yeah. See, that's uh, that's one of these words that has no English equivalent. Oh, oh. Make sure I get it right. Okay. See, we have four four K sounds. There's ka, ha, ka, ka, ka. Oh, but it's different from this one here. Anybody know what that one is? Oh, you know what that is? Herring rib, herring roll, herring roll, the eggs from herring. Oh, 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 People say, you know, they make fun of Americans for pronouncing roof, roof. roof and hoof, roof and hoof. <laughs> but each area has its own dialect, I guess you might say. And so that's the same way with our language. There's some some words that are pronounced one way with transits pronounced differently in Skidigat and then Heidelberg is a little bit different also. Then Massive will add, add uh, a syllable like sinu. Huh? 
when you ask somebody, merciful and God, Lord, for synodon kingdom, we would just say synodon kingdom, but they put God in front of it. It's going to get prosaic the way we do too, but the rhythm of the way they speak is different. Um, we, we, Massa does the same thing as. We say, and they'll say, Khaida. Khaida Gai. So it's still the same thing, it just sounds different. But my dad has said it was easier for him to understand Skinnigit than it was to understand Mastic. Because uh, the rhythm, uh, the tonal sounds are kept on the Alaska side and also with the skittigit, but there's a different tone, but those tones are still in there. For example, when we say sinodon kingdom, kingdom, Master will say, Kasinodam Adam. Adam. And we say, Adam. Adam, Adam. So maybe that's just a result of people coming back from residential school and, and then repeating what they hear rather than, than it being a true dialect difference. So, see, for us in Heidelberg, my dad and his whole generation were completely fluent in the language, but they didn't teach it to us because it was still against the law. But they taught us the concepts, the things they would teach. Like, for example, my dad's uncle, when he was talking about learning to be a fisherman, a trawler especially, you had to learn the ocean bottom. And when we go out to fish red snapper, there are no markers on the ocean, it's just water. But there's a way of, of sensing where to fish. The first time my dad took me out, we were just going and nearest land is a couple of miles in either direction. And he was in the open ocean, just out that way. And he said, okay. He stopped out for it and he said, we'll fish here. And I was wondering if maybe he put a mark on the side of the boat or something. <laughs> we put down our lines and started catching bread snapper. And then pretty soon we weren't catching any. And I said, did we catch all of them, Dad? And he said, no, we have to move. So we pull up our lines. He started the motor and we went certain distance. Okay, put your line down. We drifted off the house, off the bank. But how did they know they were there? It's a hundred feet down there. But they knew they were there. When you take a look at the hooks they design, the question becomes, how the hell did they know? And how did they know to design hooks the way they did? As a helper though. It's designed this way, but it's actually upside down. But what it is, is that thing floats about this high above the seabed. And they know that a fish approaches bait, it just doesn't just swim up and grab it. It opens its mouth and creates a suction and sucks the bait into their mouth. All fish do that. So if you're doing a hook and release, a hook fish can be a dead fish because it damages the mouth, the inside of the mouth, and they can't achieve that suction to get that fish. Whereas with Kav, we call Kavai. Kavai is uh, another word for uncle, what they call Havai. 
because it provides us with so many things. So it's sort of a nickname, but we call it uh, Uh, but halibut, its mouth opens this way, not this way. So when it's, I watched the water was a little deeper than this. We were anchored at trolling in the afternoon and just sort of taking a break. And Dad used to have those hooks all the time, and I used to fish with them. And they told me how this hook was alive if you grab the fish. So I wanted to see if that's true, because I know we'd catch halibut in that little bay, and it was a sandy bottom. So I baited one, and I went and I sent it out there, and I got up on a cabin on the boat and watched. And pretty soon I seen this dark shadow come in. It's moving real slow, and it kind of went around, and then got up close to that bait, and I watched. And as it started moving close, suddenly that hook just shot right down into its mouth because it opened its mouth and it sucked that hook right in. And so when the hook goes in, the mouth, since it opens this way, hooks into the gill, you know, on the, down the top side. And if you don't pull the hook up, the muscle will relax and the hook will come back out and you don't drown the fish. But if you start pulling it up, the way this hook is designed, because this is on the bottom side, no. I'll just do it this way. A line is down here, your anchor, another line over here, and you start pulling this one up. And what happens is it turns this this way. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen a um, documentary showing sharks when you turn it on its back. It's like it, it sort of goes comatose, almost like it's it's unconscious. It doesn't fight. Same way with the uh, hook. When you start pulling it up with this hook, it rolls it on its back, and it, it comes with the white side up, and it keeps trying to turn over, and so it's not fighting. So you get a 300-pound halibut with one of these hooks. It would come right up to where they could use that halibut killer. It's a club with a ball on the end about this big. And if it got any bigger than that 400 pounds down there, they'd use a hook then. But, uh, so the hooks were designed like that. So, so when you look at the Europeans were all using these hooks because there's, they were so efficient, they never lost any fish. But then they started manufacturing the steel hooks, and now you could put hundreds of hooks on them. So they stopped using this. And then there was another hook. shaped like this, you know, it's up here, and the bait was put here. What they would do is they take spruce and cut slivers about the thickness of my little finger, and then they go get this mull. Mull is a bull cow. It's got a bulb on the end, and they would cut off about this much, and they would take all these sticks and pack them into that kelp and bury them and build a fire over the top of it. And then when the fire burned down, they take it out and that wood was just like wet spaghetti. So now they would have a jig, a flat board with pegs in it. So they would put that, that wood in there so that the ends, so it was actually shaped like this. The ends would actually come together. And while it's cooling inside that, those jigs, they would rub fish oil into it so that it, it didn't dry and crack. And then to fish with them, they would pry this apart and put a stick in here to hold it open. They put the bait on this, and when the fish went up to, to get that bait and bite that stick with the uh, bait on it, 
the fish would go past like this, and when they did, that thing would close and clamp on the gills. So this thing would close in this way, and these sharpened ends here would clamp against the side of the gills here, and they used that for black cod. But how did they know they're down there? We're always told, oh, Raven told us. So the fish that are down there 100 feet or more, they knew how to fish for these things. And even the way we would get shrimp is uh, take some fish and put it in a basket and uh, sink it down at night, just below the surface, and then another basket sitting underneath it. And the shrimp will come up and just cluster on that basket, trying to get at that fish that's in the basket, and you pull up the bigger basket and you've got them. So, uh, mostly just a man went fishing, if you brought a woman along, what happened? What's that? Just a man went fishing? No! No! Because if there was a woman... No, everybody, when, when they go fishing, like for example, there was, there was sort of a division of labor. The halibut were, some of them were quite big. And physical strength was really important to be able to get these halibut out of the water. And so, also, part of it's a ceremony. When the halibut were brought in, they were laid out on the beach a certain way and the women would cut them. And then when they were finished and they take all the bones and they would put them back in the ocean, for more to come. And so that was returning the help of spirit to the ocean. And this was sort of um, the water carriers, the ones who give life, they would put that in the water. And then the spirit would go tell the other how but how good these humans treat us. So go see them again. Present yourself. And so and then the salmon, the only time I know of where it was only men fishing was in the spring when they had, when they fished for I think that's how you spell it. Um, um, we call it king salmon, they call it spring salmon here, that's probably spelling is incorrect. But in the spring, Hylas would gather at a place today called Cape Lookout. And I don't know how many there were, but I was told there was thousands of Hylas would gather for the ceremony. And in the morning, just before Sandra and I, just before sun, before daybreak, the canoes would be waving. And as soon as you could begin making out the shapes of things, it was light enough to see that. Then the canoes would go out and they would go. And they would go for these springs. And then before the sun went down, when the sun was on the horizon, uh, they would go in. And as they went in, the drum would start. And just as the sun is going down, it says the window opens to the other side, to that spirit world and you send a message with the drum. And so the songs and speeches would begin with that. The salmon were all laid out towards on the west side of the island, so they're facing to the east, but their backs are to the north. That's the direction of healing. It's a direction of healing and the color is black, because during the time of the Ice Age, there was a huge glacier, and it was so heavy, it was black, and, uh, when people got um, chest congestion, usually some forms of pneumonia or whatever, the wind coming from that glacier was cold and very dry. And so it would tear up all that congestion. And so when people got tuberculosis, they were sent to places where the air was dry. But this was very dry, so that was the place of healing, the direction of healing. And the color black is the comfort of darkness, where the things that can hurt you can't see you. It's sort of like you get turned to the wind. It's a place of healing and comfort. So anyway, they would lay them out that way, 
and they have huge pits dug and <clears throat> piles of rocks that are in the fire that are heating these rocks and the fish were brought in and they 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 were they, I guess they just cut them open and took the entrails out and put them in these pits and covered them I think it was maybe with something like skunk cabbage leaves and then they made layers like that and then when it was finished then they covered the whole thing and there were posts stuck in the ground in certain specific locations and then when all was covered and they were ready they pull a post out and pour seawater down to those top rocks it would create steam and they put the post and then they would pull these posts out and pour water down there and put the post back in to contain the steam underground and this would go on all night in the morning as soon as the, we'll say the raven cried that's when the light began to return they would open up the pits and the fish were all cooked and everybody would eat and you peel the flesh off and leave the tail and the spine and the head and some of them they actually took the fins too and put the fins with it and then these were carried down to the ocean and placed into the water for, for more to come and after this was finished everybody ate something and the ceremony was completed now you could fish for the rest of the year because you had taken care of them so when that movie about sharp as the, the edge of a knife or I always forget how they call it, but what it said is that when we came, each people came into being, they were put on a land that looked like them and given a language that sounded like that land and described that land and all the beings there. Then we were given ceremony on how to maintain that balance. And so it said life is like walking on the edge of a knife. If you don't watch your step and you're not careful, you could fall off the world. And part of the story tells about a boy who was making fun of him. He was walking around, walking around. And I'm falling off the world. And he stepped on a fish bone. He died of fish poison. But anyway, that's part of the myth, I guess. I mean, it's a true story. But what it says is that when the Europeans came, they replaced our ceremonies with theirs. So we've fallen off the world with the chaos. So now we have to go back to the own ceremony. And that's what I was telling you about that, that prophecy about the eagle flying the highest in the night and landing on the moon. They're coined with these holding the arrows, which symbolize the enslavement of the red people. Above the head of the eagle are the words. In God we trust. The other one, showing the eagle landing on the moon, the eagle has dropped the arrows and carries only the olive branch. And above the eagle's head on that one, The Latin phrase, e pluribus unum. That means that out of many comes one. That means we have to again become a people, not a nation. A nation is a collection of individuals that have come together for economic or political purpose. They own none of the land. Most of them aren't even related to each other and it's competing. What it is, is you take your windshield and hit it with a big hammer and it shatters, but all the pieces are there. That's us. All the pieces are there, but we're not together. So by learning our language, learning about our history, learning about uh, our own beliefs, we start coming together again. And so that's what, that to me was rather significant to see that on, on those coins. You weren't here when we talked about that. No, I was. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But when the eagle flies the highest in the night and lands on the moon, will signal the dawning of a new day for the red people. For on that day, the eagle will drop the arrows 
and carry only the olive branch or the branch. And the arrow symbolized the enslavement of the red people, and the branches symbolized the enslavement of the, of the black people. In 1969, the U.S. Lunar Earth Module landed on the moon, and NASA announced Eagle has landed. And they made a commemorative dollar in this coin, showing that Lunar Module landing on the moon. And then the last minute, they changed the design. And so, what they meant in 1972, if you look at the earlier silver dollar, it showed an eagle with arrows and olive branches. But in this one, the eagle is landing on the moon. You can see it up in the background. It's landing on the moon with the olive branch, but no arrows. And above its head, it says, E Pluribus Unum. Coincidence? Probably. Why are you saying that the olive branch represents the enslavement of black people? I don't know. That's just what the prophecy said. That there will be two uprisings of the black people, and the second will be much more violent than the first. Um, so for us, it happened in 1969. And gradually, this is beginning to happen. Um, see, a big part of it is how we view ourselves. What Martin Luther King did is he said, we're not lower than whale stuff on our body of the ocean. Black is beautiful. And you start making you feel like you can walk without making yourself be a minority. We aren't the minority. We just believe we are. And so gradually, as people begin to start redefining themselves, um, then you don't start picking on yourself. You're, see, we're taught to be humble. You gotta be humble. I used to go to sweats where there was actually a competition as to who was the most humble. <laughs> That's kind of yeah. but, but instead, we were told, <laughs> the way we were told is that the courage to be tall enough to not be small. That means my stature is determined by how tall I am, not how small I make somebody else look. And my being is not physical, it's my mind, my mental. Because if my body was me, if I'm shorter than you, I'm less person than you. Cut off the finger, you reduce my humanness. So it's all how we look at ourselves. And I was telling the others, used to be they would take a baby out on a moonless night, just stars, and hold the child up to the sky and say, That's all your relatives. And tell the stars, This is your grandchild, look out for them. And one day, one evening, this old man took us out, we were three teens, and it's said, look at that. You know, we're looking at the sky. You know, we can help her look at that. She's looking. And he said, you know, when a white man has big problems, he looks up at that thing and he says, when I look at that, how small I really am in my problems, they're not that important. He said, don't ever do that to yourself. When you look up there, you say, that's all my relatives, now I'm as big as anything. So everybody's important. It's not what price somebody else puts on you. It's how you feel about yourself. What I learned from my dad, my dad built his own house. My grandfather built his own boat. Dad owned his own boat. And there wasn't anything that my dad couldn't do. And he would take the time to show me how to do things. He didn't just say, follow me out, yell at me. No, this is how you do it, now do that. And leave me to do it, and then he would come and say, hey, I never tried that, that's great. <laughs> I mean, I had it all wrong, but I'd say, well, how do you do it? Well, I don't know how you do that. So then, I grew up believing I could do anything. I went to university in 1959, I was 17 years old. I didn't even know what a university was. Later I went to law school. 
It never occurred to me that I couldn't do it. I wanted to get a PhD in sociology. Well, first in economics. And the head of the department said, no reputable school will have you. I said, my grades. He said, I have nothing to do with it. He said, every time you put together an economic model, you insist on putting the environment in it. It's an externality. It affects nothing. They won't accept you. So I went to the head of the department. I was also working on a degree in sociology. So I said, I want to go get a Ford Foundation grant to get a PhD in sociology. And again, no reputable school will have you now. Why not? Well, sociology is about conflict. That's how all society grows, is through conflict. And you talk about cooperation. You destroy the world of sociology. So I said, well, how do you go to law school? I was at the University of Minnesota in Lawrence, and they said, well, you have to call the main campus. So I called the St. Paul. And they said, you have to take this exam, kind of funny thing, L-S-A-T. Well, where do I go to take that? Well, you got to fill out an application. Okay. So I filled out this application. I don't know how long it was before I got a call. Come and take this exam. Well, they sent me a bunch of material. It looked interesting. I looked through it. Then I went and wrote the exam. I don't consider myself brilliant. It's just that I'm not known, not done. I wrote that exam. I applied to Stanford, UCLA, and the University of New Mexico Law School. I got accepted to all three. I, I scored high enough on the LSAT thing. <laughs> and it's because I just believed I could do it. I mean, it wasn't a conscious thought. I just don't do it. Now, there's some things I can't do. It's mostly because I won't. And so we have to start, again, believing we can do things. When you're rolling, you never think that you can't do it. You're one, I'm going to go and get this. I'm going for this, you know. It's never a thought about why I can't do it. But we do that to ourselves. So when we're looking at our language, we always make ourselves bigger, not tougher. It's about strength, not toughness. This old man told us boys, yeah, that drum. He said it's time you learn the difference between a tough guy and a strong man. And he started whipping that drum. And he says, good job. The drum can make lots of noise. But without a song to give it life, that's all it is, is noise. And that's the difference between a tough guy and a strong man. It's down here. You don't walk around trying to look tough, wear t-shirts, cut off. Look, there was one guy going like that, he used to make fun of him. So he stopped doing that. But the whole thing was, again, it's, you're facing it, but you anchor yourself. And you anchor yourself in your own culture. In Haida, it used to be said that like the forest, the roots of our people are so intertwined that the greatest troubles cannot overcome us. We didn't have any form of national government, you might say. But you mess with one of us, you got to take on all of us. And that's why there's so many stories about hiders going and doing all the terrible things we're supposed to have done. Like one of the stories comes from Seashell, where there were four hiders were out there. They were chasing some fur seals, I think it was, or sea otters. And this kutlu, a small canoe, were hunting. And these seashell people saw them. And hiders were much taller than everybody else. And so if you could kill a hider, you know, there was, there was status to that. So they started chasing this small canoe. And they went to try to get away. And as they got close to land, they decided one guy's going to make a run for it to tell people what happened. So as soon as they hit the beach, he jumped off and ran. The others took their paddles and they waited. And that paddle was like a sword. He cut with it. And so they fought. They didn't survive. He made it home. And there was sort of a peninsula sticking out. 
And toward the end of it, there's a Spanish priest was in his camp there. And he heard this noise. And it was in the morning. These, these canoes, 10 hydro canoes, were sitting there waiting for daylight. The women had the paddles. And as soon as it started getting light enough to see, the women started screaming, pounding the whole canoe into their paddles. And it caused a lot of panic, people running out, and then they jacked the canoes into the beach. And the men could jump off, and then they pull off shore and wait. And when the priest came to find out what was going on, he found only two people left alive. They hadn't been meant to leave anybody because this was an unprovoked attack when they killed Hybus. But see, when they fled too to the other side of that, there was more canoes waiting for them on the other side. It's the same thing with people in the Courtney's. They ambushed the Hyder canoe with people from four villages. And this one 14-year-old boy made it a He made a run for it. He made it to the north end of Vancouver Island. And one day when he saw canoes coming, he flagged them down, they were hydras, and he told them what happened. So they went and attacked four, four Courtney villages, and they left to kill everybody but the 14-year-old boy. And the same thing with the lungies. They killed even the cats or dogs. And uh, so long after that, many of the tribes moved away from the ocean, moved up into the rivers. Um, but that's, that's, there was no reason for us to go and attack anybody else. We had everything we needed out there on the islands. We were 90 miles offshore. And nobody's going to come out and pick a fight because they had to get away. 90 miles, long way to go. So they then was the canoes. They could have made her bad people. Some people, they do dumb things. And that was in the 18, late 1800s, there are some newspaper accounts in Fort Townsend, Washington. About two hydras were accused of murdering a white man. And they were going to put him on trial for murder. And everybody was terrified because the newspaper says 1,500 of these white Indians were coming. That's what they called us, hydras, because they're light skinned and tall, these white Indians. The copper ones aren't that, you gotta watch out for these white Indians. <laughs> <laughs> when Heidi showed up, they turned the two guys loose because they weren't the guys that they'd be killing anyway. <laughs> Justice was served. So, and the same with the Russians. Um, yeah, there's one of the stories I put on Facebook too was about the Russian sea captain that was wiping soot on the face of these hardy hunters on the ship. And one fighter was really incensed by that, so he went back to low decks and he told his two Lama uh, slaves to load their musket guns. He said, We're going to go back out there. If that captain wipes that thing on my face again, I want you to thrust him in the head and move. If the captain's wife comes out, you fix her. So they went out and he wiped soot on his face with a rag and he was laughing, walked away. So he told him, go ahead, thrust him in the head. Shot him in the head. That was it. The wife was in the cabin back aft and heard the gunshot and came out to see what it was and saw her husband's body there in a pool of blood. She ran to him. So he said, fix her. And they shot her too and they threw the bodies overboard. And I told the first mate, turn the ship around, take us home. So he promised he would. And during the night on the, on the compass, it's called a binnacle. And it's set up so that north faces north, you reverse it. Now north and south are reversed. And so that's what the first mate did during the night. But when the hiders woke up in the morning, the ship was rolling the wrong was wrong. And they knew something was wrong, so they immediately went to sea. And when they saw it, grabbed the first mate and said, you turn us around and take us home, we'll kill you right here. So I took him home and said, we're going ashore, he was the only one. I would get even with every one of you for killing your captain and his wife. And that fall they were invited to go to New Archangel, today it's called Sarah, for a feast. And while they were up there, 
the Russian governor asked, which one of you hikers was that killed that captain and his wife? The guy says, I did. So they had the soldiers arrest him. And they said, tomorrow we're going to have a trial. If you're found guilty, we're going to hang you by the neck till you're dead. So they took him. The next day there was a tribunal with three judges. And the first mate told his story. And suddenly the door got busted open and the windows were busted. And here were Hydras and Kendrick together with bows and with guns. And the chief walked in there and he said, if you harm one here on that man's head, we're going to kill all of you. You got guns south there on your ships, but you can only load and fire and shoot so fast. You'll get lots of us, but we'll get all of you. Now you let that man tell his story. So he told what happened. He was acquitted. So that chief, I always forget his name, but anyway, he said, from this day forth, if we catch you within 20 miles of land, we're gonna kill you on sight. So for about 20 years, the ships wouldn't go anywhere near the coast where the Northern Highlands, because if they could see your ship, they'd come after you. And those canoes can make up to 30 miles an hour with a sail. And what they would do is they'd come up behind the ship. And because the ship was rolling, it's hard to aim a cannon. And you couldn't hit them with the, with the musket because the bow was in the way. So what they'd do is they'd, they'd come right up alongside and cut the sail. And there was men standing ready. And a guy'd step on his hand and he'd throw him like that right up onto the ship. They, they destroyed, I think it was 10 ships, maybe even more. Uh, some, they burned all the way, all the way down, totally destroyed. Some of them were badly damaged, and one was a trap where they, they caught, they uh, caught the hydras that were attacking them. And um, what they did was they cut their hands off and threw them in the ocean. Um, that, Sahara who was there with them, they shaved his head and then put chains on him, cut his hands off and then threw him in the ocean too. But that was, so that sort of ended the um, canoes going after European ships. But it's never talked about. It's kind of in history records it. And um, a governor named Edlin, this Russian governor, they hadn't been resupplied from Siberia and they knew they were facing starvation. So they talked to Klingit and asked, how do we approach these hikers? Because we're not going to be able to make it through the winter. So they sent this guy down. And as they were coming ashore, what they did before, they saw Governor Baranoff. He had 1,300 Aliyahs with him. And so when they went ashore, there was no hikers present. Pretty tiny, gigantic. So they went ashore and hiders were waiting for them in the woods. And most of them had the slave or power of paddles. It's a huge, huge paddle, sharpened like a sword. And some of them were just uh, for fighting like the Maori used, sharp on one end, cut on the other end. And so what they did was they had rows of two spades about, no, two fathoms apart. And what they did was when they got everybody on the beach then they went charging down right to the water and each like, if there's well, somebody to my left, I turn to my right, he turned to his left and they started killing. They killed a bunch of uh, Baranoff's crew and 11, 800 I think of colleagues. And so the next time when they came back, this time, as they got close to the shore, the Russians looked down on the water. And once you do that, you, they can't attack you. So they let them come ashore and they negotiated for food. And so in the fall of 1838, I think it was, I, was, I don't remember, I was quite young at the time, so I don't remember the exact day. But anyway, uh, 55 canoes left from Cape Luzon, or Cape Hane, 
the Sitka, it's 280 miles. They ate their morning meal at Kaikani and the evening meal at Sitka. So they covered almost 300 miles in 10 hours. And so with those sails, those canoes, my dad said, go like a scared wolf. <laughs> and one canoe of 90 footer had something like 4,000 pounds of cargo on it and over 20 people on it. So they were rather large. Um, but we don't talk about those parts of our history because war was not a normal thing. In fact, when you fought with somebody like that, before you could go back in the village, you had to go through this house to be cleaned, this sweat house. And you had to sing songs and whatever for the spirits of the people you brought were killed. So you had to take care of all that before you could even go back into the village and be accepted as being peaceful. So it was not a simple thing where warriors were going to go kill somebody. So there was a European version of leadership was quite different. In fact, most of our problems today are we've got too much management and not enough leadership because we think we can manage everything rather than be leaders. I tried being a leader. But I didn't know where we were going. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I covered a whole bunch of things here. And like I said at the very beginning, I don't know enough of the language to be able to teach you to speak it. But so what I want you to understand is the cultural underpinnings of it, so that when you do learn to speak the language, you're not just saying sentences and vocabulary and phrases, but you're expressing an ancient understanding of the world in our place in it. So, um, when we talk about family, family lineages too, like uh, when my mother died, my dad's sister came to my, there's seven of us siblings, came to us and said, I'm your mother. My mom said when her father died and her mother remarried, the husband didn't want the kids. So they went to the husband's sister. They went, that's where they would go, to the husband's sister. In this case, it's my dad's sister, which became our mom. She would never replace my mother, but she was our mom. And should my dad have gone, then my dad's brother, I would call him dad, not uncle. I would call him Hada. I mean, Hana, Hana is what I would say, Hada is what the girls would call him, because my mother and her sisters, her clan sisters, were all Allah. Allah. They were all my mothers. And my dad's sisters were all my aunts. My mother's brothers were all my uncles. And my dad's side of it, what they call cross cousins, we call Kiwi. That means we're so closely related, we can joke with each other real hard and we can't get mad. <laughs> Trust your heart. So it was all about balance because we're always going to cause some discomfort for someone. And so we live our life trying to avoid causing discomfort. So we tease a lot. And one guy at home, he said, if I'm civil to you, I don't like you. If I tease you, I like you. <laughs> I just love to tease. <laughs> huh? yes. So much. I get teased all the time. Well, anyway, I didn't get a chance to finish my cookie. Morning. Oh. 9 a.m. Sunday. Todd told me I shouldn't do this. 9 a.m. Did you get one? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Behind you. Body movement. Okay. Strong. 